I talk, so he's kidding. He's giving me the evil eye. All right, so uh, you'll see we have a break after Dr. Gerber. Let's don't take that break, and I'll give you a break between Adam's talk and my talk. Is that good? Yeah. All right, so is Jeff Gerber in here? There he is. So our first speaker today, hey, guys in the back, can you guys be quiet? Thank you. Thank you. So um, that's the nicest way I can say it. I feel bad. So. Sure, or uh, the teachers used to say, and everybody had to raise their hands. Everybody had to everybody raise their hands. There you go. All right, so our first speaker today is Dr. Jeffrey Gerber. You may know him as Denver's Diet Doctor. Uh, he was also the one of the conference co-organizers for the Low Carb Fail Conference that you might have heard about from February. Hey, you got some fans. Got some fans. But he's going to give a great talk on Framingham and the muddy water. So give a warm, low-carb cruise welcome to Dr. Jeffrey Gerber. Uh, it's an honor to be here again. So I'm a family doctor from Denver, Colorado, and we use food as medicine. And apparently that's a novel idea still in 2016. Go figure. So um, we have this guy, Dr. Ted Naiman. And he gave this awesome talk the other day. But during that presentation, where is Dr. Naiman? Oh, I wanted to rag on him a little bit. In about 30 seconds, he gave my talk. <laughs> so what I figured I would do is slow it down a little bit for the rest of us who couldn't follow. <laughs> yeah, because I think this stuff is important. So. What I'd like to talk about today is diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and navigating through the muddy waters when it comes to cardiovascular risk assessment. So I'd like to introduce you, not advancing. I don't think it's plugged in. Use the uh, oh. down button if you have to. Okay. Nope. Ah, there we go. So I'd like to uh, introduce you to a couple of people first. So on the right of the screen is my problem solving engineering friend, Ivor Cummins. Where are you, Ivor? <laughs> he should be here. And that's me in the middle. Well, anyway, last summer, he convinced us to uh, visit and interview the gentleman on the left of the screen, and that's Dr. Joseph Kraft. And Ted mentioned him the other day. Now, Ted was actually there, but he missed the photo op. Maybe next time, Ted. But anyway, um, um, Dr. Kraft is 95 years old there, and um, uh, he's now retired, and he says hello, he's doing great. And um, Dr. Kraft spent a career studying insulin metabolism, and he noted that there was a strong association, a strong connection between diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So much so, when you saw this quote that, I'm going the wrong way, that he said that those with cardiovascular disease not identified with diabetes are simply undiagnosed. And I'd like to explain to you why he said that. So Dr. Kraft was um, the chief of pathology and nuclear medicine at St. Joseph Hospital in Chicago for over 35 years. And during that cre uh, career, he discovered what he termed the five-hour insulin assay. And I'll talk to you about that. And he did the assay over that career in 16,000 people. That's astounding. He also um, personally did over 3,000 um, autopsies. He collaborated with other uh, researchers looking for root cause. Now, Dr. Kraft was well published in the medical literature, but it was not until he retired that he wrote a book called Diabetes Epidemic in You. And I think this is an awesome book, and I wish that every healthcare professional would read this book. Um, it's a hard read, but there's some great information. And so Dr. Kraft basically detailed his entire career. Uh, he talked about the insulin assay and cardiovascular risk, and I'd like to detail that briefly now. So what I believe he set out to do was to demonstrate that standard methods of diagnosing diabetes and prediabetes were inferior. And by standard methods, we're referring to measurements of blood glucose or hyperglycemia, okay? And we're talking about fasting blood sugar, which is just absolutely a terrible screening test. 
and believe it or not, doctors are still using that today. Um, we're talking about uh, the two-hour glucose tolerance test, uh, which is uh, giving a uh, glucose challenge, say 75 grams or 100 grams of glucose, and then measuring the blood sugar two hours later. And he even showed that that wasn't good. And he even showed that hemoglobin A1C as a screening tool wasn't so good either. And so let's talk about the five-hour insulin assay. So this uh, test was based on radioimmunoassay that was uh, being developed in the 1950s and the 1960s. And it was a tool that would enable us, or the researchers, to measure uh, very low concentrations of substances in the blood. And in this case, we're measuring uh, insulin in microunits. And at the time, people understood or be began to understand that diabetes was a disease of insulin ex excess, but nobody had quantitated it, and that's what Dr. Kraft had set out to do, and he was trying to create a gold standard test using this uh, insulin assay. And so the test, um, although he did it 16,000 subjects, because he told us that, and I'll talk about Ka Catherine Croft, she actually has the raw data. Uh, in the book, he, he talked about over 14,000 patients. And so the insulin assay is similar to a glucose tolerance in that you give a challenge. So in an, in an adult population, Dr. Kraft gave them 100 grams of glucose. And then what he would do is not only measure glucose, but he will also measure insulin over a five hour period of time and then during uh, intervals. And when he um, looked at the patterns, he noted that it clustered into five distinct patterns. So there was pattern one that he called normal. There was pattern five that he called uh, low. And then there were three patterns of what he termed hyperinsulinemia or diabetes in situ. And so what Dr. Kraft had created was a new method to diagnose diabetes and prediabetes and even diagnosing diabetes at its earliest stage. And so we'll take a look at the patterns and we have to thank Ivor Cummins for these amazing graphs. So this is pattern one or normal or uinsulinemia. And what's distinct is that the fasting insulin is low and let's say under five micro units, uh, Ted mentioned that, that you would be okay. But you can see that the insulin never peaks above 60 micro units. And now superimposed on the blue and the normal we have the three patterns of hyperinsulinemia or diabetes in situ. And so pattern two and three, which is in the um, yellow and the orange, are similar in that fasting insulin is normal, and then pattern two, the insulin in the uh, yellow will peak early, and then pattern three uh, will peak late. Pattern four is, is distinct in that the fasting insulin not only is high, and then the insulin goes sky high, almost up to 200 micro units. Now, um, it's not really, for, my, for me, I don't think that the patterns are that important, but just to understand that pattern two, three, and four really represents a condition of insulin excess where the beta cells in the pancreas are just pumping out insulin, they're screaming. And then what we have is what I like to call pesky pattern five. And so we should talk about that. And so thinking about, well, what conditions cause low insulin? And here uh, we can see that the insulin doesn't spike uh, up above, say, 10 or 15 microunits. And so there, there are two obvious conditions where you have a low insulin. That would be when you're a type 1 diabetic, you never made insulin in the first place. And then the second condition is what we call a burnt out type 2 diabetic, where the pancreas just said, I give up. Okay, but there's two other conditions where we see this um, low insulin pattern. And so number one is people doing a low carb diet. Anybody doing a low carb diet here? <laughs> okay, yeah. And then number two, um, somebody who was fasting. Okay, so what Dr. Kraft had showed, actually had shown back in 1975, that you could take uh, individuals who are on a low carb diet and before doing the insulin assay, you could carbohydrate load them for uh, 
a week or two prior, and we're talking it was 100, 150 grams of carbs. And the pattern would revert back to either a normal pattern one or something, something else. And the point there is that having that pattern five, when you're doing a low carb diet, doesn't mean that you're somehow insulin deficient or having a diet that's deficient in carbohydrates. It's a normal physiologic adaptation to not eating carbohydrates. The term we use today is um, physiologic insulin resistance. And so um, this is just interesting for me because I've, I do glucose tolerance tests. I'm actually one of the few doctors and I do insulin. I've done now over 2,000 of them and I'm never gonna catch up with Dr. Kraft. <laughs> But um, it's, it's just interesting to, um, to know what, what to do with patients who come into my office and, and they're on low-carb diets and they all want to do you know, uh, this, this insulin assay. And so um, I think the bottom line is that the, the Kraft assay, or at least doing it in this method, is really good for the mainstream to kind of screen, okay? Dr. Westman had properly mentioned out that this is a whole new paradigm, folks. This is a shift in our thinking, and, and the standard methods don't necessarily apply to low-carb people. But that doesn't mean that you can't do an insulin assay. I mean, if you're, if you're understanding how it works uh, and you're working with somebody who understands it, uh, we do actually have some low-carb people that um, sometimes carbohydrate load. Sometimes they don't even carbohydrate load. So Ted doesn't do any of this stuff anyway. He just he triangulates. He doesn't like to do the, uh, the he thinks it's uh, terrible to feed uh, patients glucose. I, I agree, but we don't do this that often. Okay, so um, the other thing that Dr. Kreft said is that hyperinsulinemia occurs before hyperglycemia. So how can we demonstrate that? So my friend and colleague, uh, <coughs> Catherine Crops from Auckland, New Zealand, actually is a PhD uh, candidate. And she actually got a hold of Dr. Kraft's original data and wrote her thesis based on um, the data. Now, what she did is uh, shared with me here is her unpublished data. I, I asked her and she said that would be fine. But she took a subset of Dr. Kraft's patients, actually the adult patients. And in these graphs, there's one missing. Um, she actually shows the three patterns of hyperinsulinemia. It's actually four patterns because she broke pattern two into 2A and 2B. But across the board here, in the blue, you can see that uh, in all the subsets, they had hyperinsulinemia, but yet they were euglycemic. Their blood sugars were normal as defined by the fasting blood sugar and the two hour glucose. So indeed, hyperinsulinemia occurs often before hyperglycemia. So I still wasn't convinced that standard methods was inferior because I, I, I did a lot of, I do a lot of glucose tolerance tests even before Dr. Kraft. So I wanted to understand this. So I created something called a, I recompiled his data. It took me a long time because I struggled with that stuff. But um, um, I created what's called a confusion matrix. Okay, so this is where your eyes glaze over, okay? <laughs> this is my one slide. So. So this is the confusion matrix, but uh, the, the um, engineers, um, Dave will call this uh, type one and type two errors, I think is how it's referred to. But it's really, it's really useful. And in medical research, we're actually trying to compare one method to the other. So in this case, we're comparing the gold standard test, the Kraft test of hyperinsulinemia on the top to um, the standard method of hyperglycemia or measurement of blood sugar on the left. And so you can see on the right side of the matrix that the positive and negative predictive value will tell the individual their likelihood of having a given disease in this, in this uh, uh, in situation, we're talking about hyperinsulinemia based on hyperglycemia or based on glucose, okay? And then on the bottom of the screen, we have sensitivity and specificity. And that tells the researcher, the clinic, clinician, how valid or accurate their test method is. And so what you can see is based on a, a high positive predictive value of 97% and a specificity of 92%, 
that if, if you get a, a positive test of hyperglycemia, you can rest assured that you have like hyperinsulinemia and that you don't even have to do the craft test. Okay, so no worries. But the problem is, is when you do the standard method and we're talking about a glucose and glucose tolerance test and you get a normal result, well, what does that mean? Not, it's not so good. So you can see that the negative predictive value is only 28% and the sensitivity is only 52%. So it's not reassuring if you have a normal blood glucose. So that's the confusion matrix. And uh, it's, it really just, I, I'm surprised Dr. Kraft didn't put that in his book. But I told him I did it. <laughs> he said, thank you. But, um, <laughs> so, um, in order to explain when you're euglycemic, I, I wanna just move to the next two slides. It might make it a little bit easier so we can get off this rotten slide. Okay, so um, you're euglycemic. You have a normal sugar response. Well, based on positive, the negative predictive value, you're only 28% certain that you're normal, but on the flip side, you're 72% certain that you're not okay or you're, or you're not normal. Okay, so that's, again, not good. And then, um, remember I said if you have a positive sugar, then you're pretty good. But again, if you look at the sensitivity of the test, the test is still missing 48% of the people. So the bottom line is, if you do this type of testing, blood sugar and even glucose tolerance test, a normal result provides a false sense of security. Okay? I could have just said that and skipped the confusion. <laughs> So the next question is, could Dr. Kraft's test predict population risk? And so I think what's important to understand is it wasn't designed to do that. It was only designed to show how standard methods were inferior. But what you can do is take the Kraft method and apply it to other populations and see what you get. And so we have two studies here. The first is, uh, they're both NHANES studies, National Health Survey studies. Uh, this first one is from 2015 and they, uh, estimated that up to 52% of the population in the U.S. is now diabetic or pre-diabetic. And yeah, that's about right. Now, people criticize NHANES because it's just surveys, but I have to tell you, this test was done proper. So in 2012, they um, took uh, almost 3,000 people that represented the U.S. population, and they actually did proper standard, standard testing. They did fasting blood sugar and glucose tolerance tests. And so, as I said, doctors don't do glucose tolerance tests. So they, it was a proper test and it came up with 52%. And based on standard testing, that's spot on, that is right. Okay, UCLA confirmed it in, in this year. They, they also estimated that you know 55%, the numbers are very similar, of Californians are diabetic and pre-diabetic. So imagine if they'd done a craft assay on these two populations, okay? Which of course they didn't, but you could easily say that, that over 75% of, of, the, of the group would be um, hyperinsulinemia. <laughs> I'm sorry, hy have hyperinsulinemia. So that's just astounding. But that's how we operate. <laughs> that's, uh, Dr. Nally says 80% of his patients have a problem, right? 85. Oh, okay, that's crazy. So. Okay, so I would like to shift gears and talk about cardiovascular risk a little bit more. And first ask the question, is there a diabetes paradox? And so some people say, not the doctors in this room, that um, despite seeing more diabetes and obesity over the decades, that we're actually seeing less heart disease, huh? Okay, so we have to think about that. And what's true is that since 1995, we've done a much better job treating the complications of heart disease. Thanks to modern medicine, the emergency medical system, smoking cessation plays into it. But we're talking about morbidity and mortality, okay? What we're really asking is, is the occurrence or the incidence or the prevalence of cardiovascular disease. And that's a tougher one to answer, okay? And I think a way to answer that question is to look, what I, look at what I call subclinical disease. So, subclinical cardiovascular disease. And so the question is, well, how would you do that? So we think that the cardiovascular imaging, such as the calcium score that I'll discuss in the end, is a great way to actually look inside and see what the subclinical disease 
status is. The other thing is that you can look at the autopsy data from individuals that, that had passed away from non-cardiac causes. And when you look at that, you can see that with more diabetes and more um, obesity, there's more heart disease. So there's no diabetes uh, paradox, but a lot of people challenge low carb with, with that issue, Eric. In South Africa, there, you won't remember, but, but I remember, because this is my hot topic, and, and this slide is devoted to the guy in South Africa that asked the question challenging all this. Okay, so Dr. Kraft said that atherosclerosis was a metabolic disease, and the metabolic de defect was hyperinsulinemia. And so, um, you know, he said basically, look, if you're not addressing metabolic disease, you're missing cardiovascular disease. And then Dr. Uh, Jerry uh, uh, Reven came along in 1988, and uh, he made headlines for uh, Syndrome X, what we now call metabolic syndrome, and he too noted that atherosclerosis was a, car it was a metabolic disease, and he called it insulin resistance. And insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia are intimately related. We could think of insulin resistance as occurring kind of downstream. But um, Dr. Reagan uh, <laughs> broke it down further into glucose intolerance, hyperinsulinemia, and interestingly, atherogenic dyslipidemia, okay? And uh, Raven wasn't really a low carb person, but he understood that it wasn't necessarily the um, concentration of cholesterol that was important, but rather the quality. Again, this is uh, in Dr. Westman's words, the paradigm shift. You know, it's a whole new ball game here. So now we're dealing with the quality of the cholesterol, and we can measure that looking at the ratio of triglyceride to HDL. Now we can look at the particle size, and you see, you know, the total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, that lipoprotein uh, parameter is not in here. Also, hypertension was part of it. And then abdominal obesity, I don't know why it's in this slide. But anyway, when I had learned about, first learned about metabolic syndrome, this made so much sense, and it makes so much sense to you as well, that this really was a cohesive uh, uh, way of understanding chronic disease. It all came together, okay? And um, I thought that this would be a great opportunity for both Dr. Reven and Dr. Kraft to kind of get on the nutrition band bandwagon. But like everything else, you know, these guys were afraid to t touch that giant elephant in the room. They just didn't want to go there. And uh, most doctors had heard about um, metabolic syndrome today. And I thought that, uh, you know, wow, this is great but it really didn't get, gain much traction. Now, you know, I think the healthcare professionals are looking for medicines. You know, maybe metformin helps this, but truly I see this as a nutritional uh, syndrome and it was just a, a missed opportunity. But now it's our turn. Okay, so, you know, since Kraft and Raven, um, we have this well-established associational, if not causal relationship between diabetes and heart disease, okay? But when it comes to clinical medicine, not so fast. So we see to this day, patients coming in that they're diabetic and they don't know that they have heart disease. On the other side, we have heart patients that don't know, sorry, heart <laughs> patients that don't know that they're diabetic and even worse, their clinicians are absolutely clueless in 2016. So, question is why is there this disconnect so I'd like to invite you and welcome you to the Framingham distraction uh, yeah. as we like to call it <laughs> so that's Framingham Massachusetts where the original cardiovascular risk assessment studies began in the 1940s and they were looking at things as as, as hype, things such as hyperlipidemia smoking, hypertension, and diabetes. And since that time, they've come up with other guidelines, they have risk calculators, and there has been one central theme and one central theme only. That is to lower lipoprotein, to lower cholesterol. And therein lies the problem. When you go to your doctor and you want to talk to them about cardiovascular risk, what's the first thing they jump to? Statins. Well, statins, <laughs> cholesterol, that's right. And this is why. This negates the metabolic component of disease. That's it right there. So this is a distraction. 
thank you, Dr. Westman, because he loves to call it that. I stole your terminology. <laughs> but, um, you know, that, look, diabetes risk is buried in there. That's the problem. So we look at diabetes as that metabolic component. And so the focus is different, paradigm shift. But let's, let's step back. What's so good about lipid lowering th therapy? So, you know, medical doctrine says that high cholesterol is bad and requires remedy, okay? So what are the mechanisms? Well, we have uh, this one theory that there's some concentration, some lipoprotein concentration gradient in the blood vessel and the blood vessel wall and then the cholesterol gets in and causes atherosclerosis. And then um, we have this other theory of in inflammation, which, which is, I like that one, that one's not so bad, but that was not, that's just come up in recent years. But to me, the, the mechanism re remains elusive. And so let's look at the experiments, okay? So we can look on the nutritional side of it and look at this diet heart hypothesis. And since the days of Ansel Keys, you know, they haven't been able to demonstrate that reducing saturated fat and increasing um, vegetable oils and our carbohydrates would show a benefit. In fact, it, it hasn't. There, there, the, the studies, just the majority of them, have been statistically noisy. And then just recently, there's a group from NIH that revisited some studies, specifically the Sydney Heart Protection Study and also the Minnesota Coronary uh, Survey. And uh, what they demonstrated, or they found that uh, there was data that was buried for years and years and they pulled that data up and they reanalyzed it and they actually found that uh, when the patients went on vegetable oils that they did worse that more of them died how about that but just to qualify uh, they specifically noted that it was uh, vegetable oils that were high in omega-6 but okay they didn't know about omega-6 back then I mean they, they did they didn't realize but it was you know so there's just no evidence Absolutely. So then we can look at the, what we call the lipid hypothesis, and this is uh, medications and statins. And I think the most contested example is the Jupiter trial back in 2008. And this was the study that, that we would joke as doctors, they were trying to tell us to put statins in the water. Okay? So, you know, they're, what they're trying to say is that you should give statins for primary prevention, in other words, giving it to individuals that were actually healthy from a cardiovascular standpoint. And when you actually look at that data, for instance, a non-fatal heart attack, uh, giving a patient a statin only risk, uh, reduces their risk, or their absolute risk by 1% over five years. It's, it's not very impressive. The pharmaceutical industry will inflate that with something called relative risk. But again, when I, when I look at this, um, I don't think there's really strong evidence to support these two theories. So we can further debunk the li lipid hypothesis, and I have two other studies. Now these are associational and observational, and so they don't prove causality, but what's good about uh, these studies, and, and the studies are important, is that if there's one hypothesis, you can challenge another hypothesis with an observational study. And so we have Get With the Guidelines in 2009. And so what that study showed, they, they actually took, a, uh, a, it was almost 140,000 patients that were admitted to the cardiac care unit with coronary events. And of that group that was admitted, 75% of them were at cholesterol goal. They met the guidelines based on Framingham. So the question is, well, what the heck were they doing in the cardiac care unit if they were at goal, right? Second study, towards a paradigm shift in cholesterol treatment, so this was a review paper, and basically the conclusion of that paper was that um, they looked at elderly people, and the, elder, the, the, the people who had higher cholesterol lived longer. Okay, but again, it's observational, associational. Very interesting. So let's look at uh, the mechanisms for hyperinsulinemia and the metabolic syndrome. And they're really well established. In fact, they're endorsed by the American Heart Association here. And the mechanism of that is, is that of inflammation, oxidative stress, and something called ages, or advanced glycation end products. And all that leads to damage in, to the blood vessel wall, which ultimately leads to atherosclerosis. 
And so you can clearly see that this is an inflammatory pathway. And so what experiments do we have? Now, Dr. Ted mentioned a couple of them yesterday. So we have the Helsinki Policeman's Trial, we have Quebec Cardiovascular Study, we have Mr. Fit, it goes on and on. And basically they show if you're using diabetes as a metabolic marker, the more diabetes, the more heart disease. Now, here's the catch. Most of the data or the studies that we have are really associational, observational. But we have so many that when the studies keep confirming the same associational information, you have to really give it a, give it a think, <laughs> okay? So um, what we really need, however, is I think um, interventional trials that are really looking at outcomes long term. So the outcomes of heart attack and stroke. And um, we have, um, the, the question is, when you think about the mechanism, what should the intervention be? Diet. Diet, <laughs> right. So we should compare a low carb diet since we believe, a low carb high fat diet since we believe that, that that's the mechanism compared to a low fat diet. And so we have groups like NUSI, there's a new group of Verda that is trying to answer that question and to do randomized clinical trials. But until that time, we have some rather impressive associational data, and I tend to stick with that. So we have to make a decision. When it comes to cardiovascular risk assessment, is it gonna be the muddy Framingham tools or using diabetes uh, by itself? And so you have to understand when we compare them, we're, we're not, uh, we're looking at middle risk people. So we're not looking at high risk people. Everybody agrees that if an individual is diabetic and is a smoker and is overweight, they're, you know, unfortunately they're a walking time bomb. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the majority of the people that are middle risk. For instance, a male that may be a little overweight, you know, um, not a non-smoker, that's middle, middle risk. So when you, when you look at that muddy Framingham that we believe is actually really statistically um, noisy, okay, it's a statistically noisy, the data is not so good, um, you might predict that uh, that individual might have a two to three fold risk of heart disease. But then if you were to look at diabetes as an independent, independent marker of risk, you would see that their, their risk could be six to eight fold. And so, you know, if you're a gambling man, I would go with the diabetes risk and then to understand that so many people aren't being properly screened using standard methods and, you know, forget about insulin. Nobody's measuring that. So the diabetes risk seems to make sense. And so the bottom line here, it's the insulin, stupid. <laughs> and, you know, I'm talking about my, my dear doctor colleagues there, okay? <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, if, if the working idea is that atherosclerosis is a symptom of metabolic disease, you, you treat the metabolic disease. That's hyperinsulinemia, and, and those are the things that you really are focusing on. And to understand that many are, risk, are at risk, and you're not properly addressing it unless you think about it this way, okay? It's not a medication approach, it's a nutritional and lifestyle approach. And so the question is, what is the recommendation regarding diet and lifestyle that we want to give people to prevent those arteries from getting clogged. Okay, so that's a great slide. It's representative of junk food, you know, and I think to recommend cutting out the junk, it's not bad, but I think we really need to qualify it. And so if you think about the mechanisms, we want to explain this to the, the people that we see wherever we are, you understand and start to think about the macronutrients. So the driving fuel is again, uh, carbohydrate, right? protein, and then we consider, you know, fats, natural fats to be metabolically neutral. And so there's where the advice should lie. And so this is what we tell our patients, number one. And mind you, oh gosh, the, um, the, the federal guidelines, they go on about, um, what do they say? That we give guidelines to healthy people and healthy people only. We don't address disease. And, and then we respond, Okay, so your healthy guidelines are making everybody sick. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. So, so low carb diet is best, okay? So you're eliminating sugars, you're eliminating grains, um, starches, fiber's okay. Second, you want to uh, eliminate processed 
food. And I think most importantly, there are these, what I like to call industrial vegetable oils, canola, corn, and soy. Polyunsaturates are highly prone to inflammation and oxidative stress. That's what inflames lipoprotein. So for me, I wanna make sure that the lipoprotein circulating in my blood is filled with monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. Okay, we have the mechanism to explain it, okay? Um, as a consequence, we eat less. But I think it's really important to, for people to understand that eating less is a consequence, is a good thing, okay? So you can do that by a low carb, high fat, or you know, the intermittent fasting. And if it's something you haven't tried, I've been experimenting on the ship showing off, but, <laughs> but as the cruise goes on, I'm losing it. <laughs> I tried my best. So maybe I'll be good for the next day or two since I told you. <laughs> so, okay, so moving and activity. And this one's a shout out to Daryl, but not that we should eat less and exercise more, but there's so many benefits to activity. Smoking cessation and then um, proper sleep and happiness, of course. So clinical assessment. My physician colleagues, healthcare professionals, need to think about hyper and insulinemia early on and forget about Framingham when you know the patient wants to talk to you about cardiovascular risk. To understand that fasting blood sugar and hemoglobin A1C actually isn't such a great screening tool. I have patients with hemoglobin A1C under 5.7 and they fail the, in, the craft assay, okay? The two hour in, uh, glucose tolerance test actually isn't such a bad test. Now we've actually measured the glucose at one hour. So we've added that in there so there's another measurement and we have been looking for years for the proper value, but it adds sensitivity to the test. And then measuring insulin. So you can do a fasting insulin if it's under five microunits, you're okay, but what Dr. Kraft uh, showed is that um, anything higher, the, 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 the specificity is not so good, so you, so you don't know what you get if you, if you just look at insulin by itself. <coughs> Practically speaking, it's difficult to do the Kraft five-hour insulin assay, so what Dr. Uh, Catherine Cross has done is she, she analyzed the data again and came up with a simple method of measuring insulin at two hours after glucose challenge, and if it's under 30, you're good. If it's over 40, you've got a problem. And then lastly, looking at inflammatory markers. And this is the part where we're triangulating. We're looking at metabolic disease. We're looking at cholesterol differently. We still measure cholesterol, but we're, we're thinking about quality, not quantity. Okay, so we're gonna finish up on cardiovascular imaging. So if you want a, a method that trumps Framingham, this is it, people, okay? so. When we're talking about looking for subclinical disease, we really want a method that is uh, inexpensive and non-invasive. And so the one that, that we like most is the coronary artery calcium score. So in terms of invasivity, it's a CAT scan, and we, call, we like to call it the mammogram of the heart because it uses a similar amount of radiation, and you can do the test every two to three years, and it's very simple to do and inexpensive. So here are uh, two images of calcium scores on two different people. So the technology is really cool. And it's been around, I think, since the 80s. But basically, they're using a high-speed gated CAT scan machine. And um, it's taking pictures, and they do slices. It could be 64, 256 slices, where they're actually looking at the coronary arteries. Now, the, the mechanism of atherosclerosis is that normally you don't have any calcium, and then as um, atherosclerosis develops, you see first soft plaque and then hard plaque, and the hard plaque you can measure the calcium, okay? And so if you look at the image on the right, this individual has a lot of calcium. It, it's lit up, it's hard to see. Uh, I circled it in red, but that's the left anterior descending, the widowmaker artery. So that one has a lot of calcium. Now I'm guessing that this individual isn't so healthy, you can tell by the lack of muscle mass. And um, maybe I got, I got in trouble for saying I'm gonna guess that it's an older person. And as he said, oh, you know, older people can be healthy too. Yeah. But then if you look at the individual on the left who has lots of muscle mass, I don't know if he's buff, but that's me. <laughs> so that's my calcium score. Sorry, I couldn't resist. That's my calcium score from, from last year. 
And so what you can see, my left anterior descending has absolutely no calcium. So that's a perfect score of zero. Isn't that awesome? And yeah. I didn't think it would be so. But, you know, just my history is that um, I've been on a low-carb, high-fat, whole foods diet for over 16 years. And I can tell you, I, you know, am I genetically blessed? Well, no, there's diabetes in my family. And just like the rest of you, I didn't know any better back then. So, um, yeah, that's just wonderful. And I can tell you throughout the, uh, the whole sequence that the score remains um, zero. So... Um, What's interesting is that my risk, when you have a zero score, of having a cardiovascular event in 10 years is less than 1%. Whereas if you compare it to the person on the right, their, their risk is quite high. So what's really neat is that this test is quantitatable, it's reproducible, and you can see that you can score your risk. And so you can see that the zero score, you have a very low risk. And if you have a score, a calcium score of 1,000, your risk goes up to 30%, 37% more. And this has uh, been, been um, identified and studied in literally tens of thousands of patients, okay? So that's the absolute score, but even worse or better is progression of disease. And so these are survival cur curves is what they're called. And so if you look on the right, if you, the, the real thick black line, the first one, you can see that in those people that have calcium score over 1,000, and if it progresses greater than 50%, 15% a year, 15% a year, that your mortality drops, your survival drops to almost 50% by three years out, okay? But the good news is if you look on the left side, you can see that if you stabilize your plaque, that your survival, uh, your survival curve doesn't drop. I mean, it's almost like you didn't have calcium. So stabilizing plaque is golden. And how would we address this? What would be the therapeutic method? Diet. Diet. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's that simple? People don't believe it, Dr. Westman. <laughs> so, so I hope that the muddy waters are clearing when it comes to cardiovascular risk assessment. So I just discussed cardiovascular imaging, but when you and your doctor is gonna grab for that Framingham risk calculator, it's better that they would think about insulin, hyperinsulinemia, and metabolic disease because what's most important is to recognize that diabetes is a vascular disease. Thank you very much.